Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1253, 1253, Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so we have uh, some Spygate news to get to today. A couple of the things I want to mention and of course um, uh, talk just a little bit about what my thoughts are, what, what, what I expect to see during the debate tomorrow night, uh, or tonight I should say, because when you're watching this video it will be Tuesday. It's uh, late Monday evening right now. So. Anyway, uh, before I do that, though, uh, uh, again, I, I about every, it seems like every six months or so, I have some idiot who posts something in the comment section about, you know, my hair, my clothes, uh, my lighting, or whatever. So I, I have to do this about every six months just so you, you, you folks understand. Uh, understand something about my videos that I do. I, I don't uh, care whatsoever how I look when I do my videos. I do not prepare myself physically or meant, I mean, uh, 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 you know, for my videos, I don't you know, go look in the mirror or comb my hair or whatever. So, uh, as I mentioned before, okay, so um, I run a company and um, what we do where I work, we get pretty dirty a lot of the time, you know. And uh, so I wear, I mean, it's literally the clothes I wear at work, sweats, gym shoes, uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, and I almost always wear a hat. And um, so I come home from work on most days, sometimes 10, 11, 12 hour day. Uh, I do my research and I, I just try to you know get my video done. And I, I really don't take the time to you know, dress myself up or anything like that. Because I never really thought when I started doing videos anyone would care what I look like. I'm always surprised when someone comments in, this, in the comment section as if I'm here to promote my physical appearance or something. I don't give a damn what I look like when I do these videos. All I care about is the content. Um, so I really don't care. And um, <clears throat> and as far as, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, whoever the a-hole is who made that comment yesterday, um, I get paid pretty well to run this company. And if I wanted to, I could dress to the nines, my friend. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I could. But I'm just not a guy who spends a lot of money on that kind of thing. Uh, I have nice clothes if I want to wear them. I rarely ever do. I go out with my girlfriend to eat somewhere. I go something a couple times a year. I, I, I dress nice. But otherwise, I come home from work. I'm just like, I, I assume anyone else. I put on comfortable clothes, and I, I'm wearing what I'm wearing. I never really think about it. Sometimes I wear a hat. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have been wear, wearing a hat all day. I come home, and I don't put a hat on. I do the video. I look like someone who's been wearing a hat all day. So I don't care. If, if my appearance bothers you, watch someone else's videos. As far as my lighting, uh, I've addressed this one before too. About four years ago, I was diagnosed by an eye doctor as uh, being um, a very good candidate for glycoma. As a result, about four years ago, I started taking daily eye drops to prevent the onset of glycoma, which can cause you to go blind. It's also highly recommended uh, if you uh, are someone who may be having symptoms of glycoma, that you try to avoid bright lights. So where I work, we have a lot of bright fluorescent lighting and even uh, LCD lighting. So I wear glasses at work almost all the time, just, you know, even around in the office or in the plant, just because to, to keep the, the bright lights. And so I, I, I use very soft kind of low lighting uh, at home. I don't have a lot of bright light on at home. Now, I can open up the, the curtains when the sun's out and let that kind of sunlight in and stuff, but I try to avoid very bright artificial lights, which if you're shooting videos and you really care about your lighting, that's exactly what you do. You have some really bright lights or whatever. But again, I don't give a damn. Can you see me? Can you see me? Is the fact that I have low lighting causing you strain, eye strain? Is it harming you? If it is, watch another video! My lighting bothers you, don't watch. I don't care. I don't make a penny doing these videos. Not a penny. Never have, never will, because I don't need the money. I do these videos for the very reason I said I do these videos a long, long time ago. It's my, my own personal video diary. I'm doing these videos as a record of my following the Spygate story along with my timeline. I welcome anyone who wants to come in and watch to do so. If my looks offend you, if my haircut offends you, if my clothes offend you, if my lighting offends you, 
fucking leave. Now, for the rest of you, let's get back to the uh, news of the day. Uh, first, let me just talk a, a little bit uh, real quick about the debate and what I expect to have happened. First of all, uh, I hope everyone is prepared for the debate tomorrow evening. And at this time, even though many of us have been saying for a very long time, we can't believe they're actually going to put uh, quid pro quo Joe up on that stage, especially at 9 o'clock at night to begin the debate. Uh, but it looks like at this point, he's going to show. <laughs> he's going to show. So what you're going to be needing is a heap of popcorn. You're going to be needing a bag of a heap of popcorn. This is my bag of popcorn that I'll be enjoying as I watch the debates. It's a heap of popcorn. I hope you got a bag yourself. And of course, your favorite beverage. Mine would be IBC Black Cherry Soda. That's my personal choice. But you may prefer something else. Have at it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a blast. Believe me. Um, now, what I expect out of the debate is I do expect that uh, Trump, President Trump, is likely going to really, really attack Biden in his first debate on his record. I think that, um, I think that uh, Trump is going to go after uh, Biden on his record, and that would include Obama's record, because Biden likes to associate himself in Obama's presidency in his eight years and his record as being Biden's record as well. He likes to take credit as me and Barack, me and Barack, me and Barack. So I think that Trump uh, is going to uh, take Biden to task over his record and not just his record as VP, but also as a senator and all these other things. So I expect Trump to really come out uh, swinging uh, on Biden on his record um, in this first debate. I think that's the first thing he's going to do is tear down Biden's record and set the record straight on Biden's record, which is not very good, which Biden is running away from in a lot of ways. And he'll call him out on a lot of his lies as well. What I don't expect to see Trump do, I don't expect to see him making fun of Joe's obvious uh, cognitive decline. I expect that that will be obvious and apparent to most people watching, and Trump knows that. However, I would say that if, if the camera allows us to see Trump's expression when Biden goes into a one of his mental lapses, and we can assume that in an hour and a half debate, he's going to you know slip at least a couple of times into dementia land. And when that happens, I don't expect Trump necessarily to say, oh, look, Biden, he's crazy. He's out of his mind. I don't expect him to do it. But I would say watch Trump's facial expressions when Biden's mind leaves him. Uh, I think his facial expressions is, is going to tell us uh, everything we need to know and because Trump's smart enough to know that when Biden's mind you know leaves him for a moment as it often does that it will be obvious and apparent to everyone watching he doesn't really need to point that out so I don't think we're going to see Trump really hitting Biden on his mental decline the way we see him do it on Twitter or in press conferences I think he's probably not going to do that on the live stage um, I think his facial expressions will reflect that but I don't think he's going to really go after Biden's cognitive decline and, and verbally give him a, a tongue lashing about it. Uh, I wouldn't expect that, but I do expect Trump to hit Biden on his record. And uh, I, I think he'll come out swinging on that in this first debate. So we will see what happens. Now, it's not Tuesday night at nine o'clock, so there's still time for Biden to pull out. Um, I, I, I don't know what they could possibly come up with at this late stage of the game, but all, all indications are that Biden is going to come out and debate Trump. And uh, I'm sure they'll have him jacked up on something. Uh, the problem with that is there's a lot of side effects with these types of drugs that they give you to kind of get your brain firing faster. So we will, we will just have to see how that all turns out. Um, and uh, that's, that's what I'll be looking for. But mainly I expect Trump to hit Biden hard on his record. And on the record of the, the Obama-Biden record, the record of the previous eight years, I think it's fertile territory for, for Trump to work in, and I think he'll, he'll, um, he'll take full advantage of it. So that's my thoughts on the debate. Um, now let's go ahead and get to some Spygate news and some related news. So Glenn Simpson of Confusion GPS fame has a, another book out, and uh, Paul Speary has been looking at that book, and he points out in the book that Glenn Simpson says in this book 
that the person who first came to Confusion GPS to do opposition research on Trump, and I think some other candidates as well, but primarily on Trump, the first person who came out was Marco Rubio. Little Marco. <laughs> that explains a lot of things, doesn't it, about Little Marco? So yes, Glenn Simpson says it was Little Marco Rubio who was the one who came to Confusion GPS to seek opposition research on Donald Trump. Now, in the past, we've heard it was the Washington Free Beacon. Of course, we know that the Washington Free Beacon was supporting Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. Either of those two would have been preferable for the, I guess, the owner or whoever, the main guy there, Washington Free Beacon. Um, now, that's a little confusing with what Glenn Simpson is saying. So I don't know if he's saying that there was a, a deal there with Marco Rubio and the Washington Free Beacon, who was, who was actually writing the checks. I don't know. But Glenn Simpson is saying it was Marco Rubio who was the Republican who came to Confusion GPS first to seek opposition research on Trump. That's what's in his book. Of course, he lies a lot, but that's probably true. Um, here's another story that's kind of off topic, but uh, worth mentioning because uh, it's a big story, I believe. I don't know if anything will come of it because nothing seems ever to come of anything uh, has anything to do with Omar, uh, Ilhan o Omar, but you know, the, the latest um, video uh, by Project Veritas, James O'Keefe, is pretty damning. I don't know how many of you have seen it. I guess a lot of you have heard of it. But uh, you definitely need to take a look at this story. Of all the things that O'Keefe has uncovered, this may be the most damning thing I've ever seen him uncover. Um, and uh, essentially, O'Keefe uh, has got this operative who works for Omar and s some other uh, candidates like her. Uh, the, the Somali population up there in Minnesota, and he he literally uh, gets this guy uh, who's involved in ballot harvesting, who literally explains to O'Keefe exactly how they do it, and it sounds very illegal. He even shows uh, O'Keefe a car full of ballot, ballots that, that he's harvested. <laughs> so he's got this guy literally on camera uh, who's involved in what I'm pretty sure is illegal ballot harvesting operations, and he actually shows O'Keefe the evidence. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how bad, how, how bad it's got to get before you finally investigate that crazy woman. But um, yeah, I I Ilhan Omar is obviously, uh, you know, deeply involved in all this. It's been going on for a long time up there in Minnesota. I think this uh, is a big story probably in Minnesota. It should be a big story nationwide. Of course, the media won't cover it, but I, I, I you know, I, th there needs to be an investigation into in, in Omar. I mean, there's just too many things going on with that crazy woman. And uh, of course, this activity is, I, I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Um, I don't think they actually have ballot harvesting laws in Minnesota, as far as I know. But here's a guy, so we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we do it for other candidates, for Omar. Uh, I mean, and he explains the whole process of how they go about doing it. I mean, it sounds very shady. It's got to be illegal. Um, but I'd be very, very surprised if this guy is not getting a visit from the cops or <laughs> or someone in the next day or so. Um, and uh, this story should really get blown up. It should get national attention. And uh, something needs to be done about this. This is just incredible. But the fact that O'Keefe was able to get a guy stupid enough uh, with the cameras rolling to tell you exactly about the fraud he's committing and then show you the evidence <laughs> that will be used against him, Quite, I'm quite sure, in court, if it ever makes it that far, and it should. But, yeah, very good job, again, by O'Keefe. And this, this, this story um, uh, definitely needs to get national media attention. Unfortunately, it probably won't. But um, there you go. Uh, James O'Keefe strikes again. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> some very uh, interesting Spygate-related news in the last couple days. We have Full Nelson on his Twitter feed. And remember, Full Nelson was the, the, the Twitter person who um, discovered Igor, or Igor, Danchenko, Iggy, as Steele's primary subsource. And he also has gone on to uh, find three, I think, if not all by now, but couple weeks ago, he's up to three of Danchenko's friends, his drinking buddies. He's pretty much identified almost all of them now. So Full Nelson's definitely very good at figuring these things out. 
Now, Full Nelson um, had a Twitter post yesterday where he says that there are indictments. That, that Durham has had a grand jury for quite some time, and there are indictments. I assume he means sealed indictments. But he says that these will not come out until after November the 3rd. And um, he says that that is Durham's call. Uh, Durham did not want this want this information coming out till after November 3rd because he does not want it to look like it's having to do with uh, election politics and uh, or whatever. And apparently that was Durham who's made that call that he does not. And it's just I said, I mean, I've been saying this for you know a couple of weeks now. After Barr made that statement about putting out you know a report or whatever, I said, you know, Durham doesn't sound like the type of guy that would go along with something like that. And that appears to be the issue. Uh, Durham uh, wants to wait till after November 3rd before he unseals these indictments, of which there are apparently several, and that would include uh, plea deals which have been reached with certain individuals. So this is what Full Nelson is saying. He's also saying that one of the problems that Durham was having is that, remember, a lot of these people working for Durham on this investigation are FBI people, and some of them are in D.C., and some of them uh, were having serious issues uh, over the fact that there was pressure to come out with some indictments or report or something prior to the election. And apparently there was almost uh, like a, you know, dissension in the ranks and people threatening maybe to leave the investigation if, in fact, uh, that was going to happen. And so to try to um, pacify uh, some of these crybabies in the FBI who didn't want this coming out before the election, Durham said to kind of capitulate um, to these people because it would be hard to replace them on short notice. They've already been on the case for a while. He doesn't need the headaches. It's, he, he doesn't like the political nature of it either, doesn't want his investigation to be deemed and have himself deemed as some sort of a political operative working for Trump. And, and of course, the idea of putting out a interim report would would go against everything that that Durham you know believes in about you know no leaking out, don't talk about the investigation, all those sorts of things. So uh, Durham obviously had a lot of problems with it, and I think that's Barr probably ran into that and uh, wasn't maybe expecting that, and uh, that may be why Barr was forced to back off is because Durham probably said, "Hey man, you know, if we do this, you know, first of all, I don't I don't want to be." you know, doing interim reports uh, about my investigation. It's, that's not how I do things. Um, plus, you know, the idea that we're going to, you know, come out before the election, do these indictments or whatever. These are already done. They're sealed indictments. I've got guilty pleas coming. This thing's going along just fine. Um, this could really wreck things if we do this. You know, there's a lot of people, FBI, working for me there. Uh, who have a real issue with it. it, there's a lot of problems around doing anything right now. The, uh, and that's basically the uh, the message pretty much I'm getting from Full Nelson from whatever sources Full Nelson has. And you can take that for what it's worth, a grain of salt, or you can take it to the bank. I don't know what to think about it. But it makes sense. That does make sense to me. So anyway, that is the latest word on what may be going on with why... Uh, we may not be seeing it, but Full Nelson is saying there are indictments. There are sealed indictments. There are guilty pleas, several of them, and more to come. Now, we're learning about these national security letters, uh, of which we know now there were at least seven national security letters that were taken out on uh, Michael Flynn. And these seven national security letters are all taken out uh, after the case agent uh, had attempted to close the case out on Flynn two times. He attempted to close out the case in November uh, and then again in January. And both times he was forced to keep it open. And um, we now know who signed off on those national security letters. And we know who authorized them. Kevin Kleinsmith was the one who signed off on those national security letters and they were authorized by Peters Ben Strokenus. Kleinsmith and Strock, their names come up again and keep in mind
by the when these national security letters by the time that these national security letters were signed off on and authorized by Stro by Ben Stroknes and Kleinsmith, uh, the case agent had already on two occasions cleared Flynn and had tried to close the investigation two times. And there was no predicate, none, for requesting these national security letters. None. Chuck Ross. Of course, we know the code name for the investigation into Trump was called Crossfire Hurricane. Then we later learned that the investigation into Michael Flynn was titled Crossfire Razor. But we also heard about another one called Crossfire Typhoon. Crossfire Typhoon. Thanks to Chuck Ross, we now know who that investigation was into. Crossfire ty Typhoon was the investigation into Papagalopoulos. Papagalopoulos. We also know now that the reason that Peter's been stroking us and the crooked people around him, uh, the reason that they used to justify reopening the investigation into Michael Flynn was apparently the Kislyak phone call. <laughs> That's a problem because we have the entire transcript has been released and there's nothing wrong with the Kislyak phone call. There's no crime there, <clears throat> nothing close to a crime there, <clears throat> and they never discussed sanctions. There was no problem, but yet they used that to reopen the investigation into Flynn. What, because he had a conversation with Kislyak? He was the incoming national security advisor at that point. In fact, by that time, I guess he was. Because that was after the election. He had not only every right, but was doing his job. Just like everything else, Crossfire Hurricane, Razor, Typhoon, you name it, none of it was properly predicated. And they knew it. We're also learning from a tweet from Richard Grinnell. Richard Grinnell tweeted out yesterday that during his time as ODNI, he did discover a leaker and a liar in the IC, the intelligence community. He discovered a leaker and a liar in the intelligence community. And he turned it over to the FBI. Yesterday he's posting on Twitter that he still sees no evidence that that leaker and liar whom he turned over to the FBI has been prosecuted, charged, or even investigated. Well, you know, Rick, maybe you can just tell us his name. I guess since he didn't do anything wrong, that wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> just go ahead and leak it out there. Leak it to Hannity or somebody. Leak it to Dan Bongino. <laughs> leak it to somebody. Uh, but yeah, there you go. There's a, still, still a lot of problems with the deep state. Um, so if we're learning anything about the deep state it, uh, that we didn't already know, we already knew it was powerful, but we're learning it's much more powerful than we thought. These mid-tier mid and senior-level bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. run the country. And the elected officials obviously work for them. That's, that's pretty much what things appear to be. Attorney General Barr has got a big job ahead of him, as does the president. I do suspect, though, that after Trump wins re-election, that we are going to see a house cleaning we are going to see a house cleaning and the real draining of the swamp, I believe, is going to begin on November 4th, starting with Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray. A major, major swamp draining, I think, is coming. The president just needs to secure his re-election, and then I think the gloves are coming off for real. And I think the pressure, uh, he's going to apply the pressure on Barr and Durham 
And uh, from what we're hearing from Full Nelson, if they wanted to, they, they have the indictments already. They have plea deals and indictments, and there will be more to come. They, they could. They have them, and they could, uh, they could unleash them right now. But apparently they've made the decision um, that uh, they don't want it to look political. And it's, it's like I said, yeah, I mean, I think when you wait this late, yeah. I think if they could have done it in August or September, uh, I think they would have been clear. But once you get this late in the month of September and getting into October, whatever they do, it's going to be completely blown off as political. So in, in a lot of ways, as bad as I hate to say it, it's probably the right call. Because if they come out with all this, it's just going to be you know, spun is that it's a political operation and that's, you know, that's no good. That's no good. So things are what they are. Um, anyway, I expect to be back tomorrow. Hopefully be some more Towergate news. Uh, there is a very interesting article. I didn't really get into it in tonight's video. There's just too much going on with that article. It's almost one of the things you almost have to read it for yourself. So if you go over to justthenews.com, that's John Solomon's site, justthenews.com, there's an article there that's based on uh, some things taken from Lee Smith's new book. And um, it has a lot to do with the Ukraine impeachment hoax and that transition, how they went from the Mueller witch hunt right into the Ukraine hoax, the people behind it, how it all went down. Very interesting uh, story, very, very good information in there, new information I haven't heard before. So if you're looking for a really good article to read and um, you want to get greater insight into what happened there and, and how they spun on a dime, I mean, the Mueller investigation ends and two days later we got the Ukraine hoax. Uh, Lee Smith has sniffed all that out. He's got some fantastic sources of great research that he's done uh, on the, in that book. And... Uh, John Solomon does a very good article on, you know, the major points in the book, points all that out in the article. So you may want to go over to justthenews.com and check out that article. It's very, very, very well worth your time in reading that. All right, that's what I got. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you guys. Bye.